The Hammond organ, specifically the Hammond B3 or C3, has a long musical history, but it's not for everyone. It's a heavy machine that often finds itself in need of some regular repair and constant maintenance. However, when coupled with a Leslie speaker, the sound of a Hammond organ is difficult to match. Its sonorous quality and authoritative heft make it unmistakable in many of what are probably some of your favorite recordings. Adam Scone is a Hammond organ devotee. He's made the commitment necessary to become one of the 21st century's notable users. He's long been associated with the instrument and has played in jazz and boogaloo legend Lou Donaldson's band at the Village Vanguard and the Blue Note in New York City. Scone has also shared the stage and recorded with countless others, performing on over 50 albums and was selected as a jazz ambassador by Lincoln Center and the Kennedy Center for the Arts, an honor which took him to perform in over 35 different countries. When he's not working with his other band, the Sugarman Three, he's branched out to form the Scone Cash Players, a group with a slightly more experimental and thoughtful range than the boogaloo and funk he's often associated with. Their latest album on Daptone, Brooklyn to Brooklyn, features a blend of the usual grooves, but also includes intriguing group vocal treatments that add a truly unique character to this release. Join Adam and I as we discuss his life's musical journey, the many musical masters he's met along the way, the details behind his latest album, and of course, the good people who help him load out his 400 plus pound Hammond organ at the end of his gigs. Well, uh, Adam, thanks so much for sitting down with me. I really appreciate your time today. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if you know this, but the exciting thing is I'm only about seven minutes away from where I'm sitting from William Patterson University. OK, amazing. So I know exactly where you are. I spent some some good years over there. Um yeah, that's great. Yeah, my parents went to uh, William Patterson, and uh, I didn't go there, but I know they have a, a fabulous jazz program. And tell me about you know your move. You started in Ohio, right, as a young man? I did. I grew up um, around the music scene of, well, I was born in Cleveland, but grew up around the music scene of Youngstown, Ohio. And I met a lot of really great musicians there that sort of helped me along at a super young age. Uh, my family's also very musical. Um, my grandfather was a he he uh, was a fiddle player in square dance bands. Oh, cool! Along with his brother, so a lot of my youth was spent going to square dances all around uh, the the area to listen to them. And so I was always playing with them too as a young kid. Um, and then let's see, I went to yeah, I, great guys like Shedrick Hobbs and Teddy Pentalis and. In Youngstown really helped me a lot. And then uh, I eventually ended up at William Patterson and had a great experience there with the professors like Harold Mayburn and uh, uh, Pete Mallon Verney were some of my piano. Was uh, Rufus Reed uh, there during your time? Was Rufus Reed there uh, at that time? Yes, exactly. He was the head of the jazz program. Right. Um, and so that was great to be around uh, a real legend of jazz, especially because I loved his records he did with Dexter Gordon. Then I moved to New York when I was super young. I moved there when I was 19 and I was living in the city and doing the reverse commute out to to Wayne, New Jersey. Yeah. And uh, I made a bunch of lifelong friends out there, great musicians, and uh, got to see all the music I could uh, afford to go see back then. Um Right. I keep uh, kicking myself because the uh, the jazz department, the music department up there always has um, some great student shows and, you know, Sunday afternoon and stuff like that. I'm sure you played in a bunch of them and yeah. I'm always getting the emails and seeing it. And I, I'm like, I got to go to this thing. It's right up the street. I'm so stupid. I never go to these shows and I never make it, you know, <laughs> between my kids and job and everything. I'm like, oh, I'm never going to go to these shows. One day, though, I'm going to start going to those William Patterson University shows. Yeah, they have a they have a really nice performance center and yeah. uh, it's a great place to see a concert for sure. Yeah. So you got hooked up in the city and it's funny, one of your bios says something about, you know, played six nights a week at a legendary Hammond uh, club, but it didn't say the name of the club. Was it Smoke? Where were you playing? Where did you play a lot uh, that that had Hammond in the city? That particular club was called the Savoy Lounge, hmm. which uh, was not the original Savoy from, you know, 
Stop. the original ballroom days. Right. But it was a little tiny club that was kind of hidden on that street around the Port Authority bus station, the one that's kind of underneath. And they used to have a giant mural of a, a whale huh. there. Never heard and of it. So, yeah, between 41st, it was on 41st Street between 9th Avenue and 8th Avenue. So, yeah, we were the house band. We played there every uh, Sunday through, well, let me think. Yeah, we were playing there six nights a week. The only night I think we didn't play was sometimes the Saturday for a few years. Hmm. So that was a great spot to, and I put had my organ in there. So, you know, I got to play the real thing every day and we were the house band. So uh, we would get to play with all the greatest players in the city and we'd have learned their music and, and, uh, yeah, it was quite an experience, that's for sure. And back then, the gigs were all 10 to 2. So, you know, mm -hmm. four-hour gigs, three long sets. So we were really in the in the thick of it playing some music, for sure. Yeah, definitely trial by fire, for sure. Yeah. Um, so back up a little bit. When did you uh, – did you know when you went to college, when you went to William Patterson, did you know that you wanted to play organ, or were you a keyboard guy? How did you kind of connect with the Hammond um, – uh, most of our listeners we've had, I had Felix Cavallari on the program once. So uh, the show, sometimes we talk about the Hammond organ. I'm a keyboard guy too. So I, I love the, the Hammond, uh, you know, but um, it's definitely a life choice for people. It's heavy. It's expensive. You have to have, uh, you know, people work on your, your Hammond. You gotta, you gotta find the right person and uh, you have to have people to help you drag the thing around after the gig. So how did you, when did you sort of make the connection with that particular instrument? Was it, at college, before college, or were you, because you could have just done piano keyboard stuff too. Right. Yeah. It was definitely a combination of some serious influences on my life. So when I was in Youngstown, I started to play, you know, gigs around the local scene. And I was young. I was probably maybe a junior or senior in high school. Mm -hmm. And these guys took me under their wing, especially this drummer, uh, Shedrick Hobbs. It was great jazz drummer and had a you know an impressive background himself i mean he even uh played with charlie parker at some point when he was coming through and you know, played it with jack mcduff a bunch of things like that but um whenever we would play together and playing piano he would always say you know what you sound more like an organ player you should really check out the organ because just the way you play i feel like you have a sensibility for playing organ what a wild observation, right? What a, what a weird, what a weird observation to notice that. Definitely. And then um, he, there was a great organ player out of Pittsburgh called Gene Ludwig. And he, he was playing in Youngstown with Shedrick. So I went to see them and they let me sit in and play, uh, play a song with their group. And, you know, the minute I touched the real B3, I was hooked. Yeah. I thought, oh, wow, I really have to get into this because it just seemed to match my personality more for some reason. Um, I just felt more at home there. And then, uh, you know, looked in a, I was in high school. We looked in the classified ads with my mom and there was a B3, maybe, you know, 10 miles away. Some guy was selling it. So we just went over there and brought it home. And that was it. I started really to get into it. Is that the one you still have that you play today? Um, no, I do, actually do not have that one anymore. Um, that one was a later one. If you want to get into technical organ stuff, they stopped making Hammonds around 1972. Right. And that one was, I believe it was in 1972. And at that point, they uh, were cutting some corners on quality. Right. So that particular B3, constant problems. I was always having to solder things or get new tubes or get the repair guy if it was something I couldn't handle. Um, but it sounded great when it worked. But, you know, I eventually sold that. And and now I have a bunch of organs scattered all over the United States. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was, I do love that organ, but I'm, you know, it was time to move on from that. And you, you, you know, when you're at a gig, you want it to work. Right. So. Absolutely. No, nobody wants to be soldering anything on stage before you go on. 
True. And uh, oh, so you're also, you know, a part of Sugarman 3. And uh, I guess this is an opportunity we're here to talk about. Uh, not that, but we're here to talk about your recent release, Going to Cash Players, Brooklyn to Brooklyn. And I guess this is an opportunity to break out of the uh, the trio thing, right? You can broaden your sound a little bit. Uh, what led you to kind of creating this group? And uh, tell us about the new record a little bit. Here, and here you are playing a, is this a B3 or this looks like a, this looks like a, it's not a C3. It's a, or, or that's it's, a C3. It yeah, is that's a C3. C3. Yeah. All right. I get points for, for, for having the eye. All right. Yeah, so the if if the listeners don't know the difference, the C3, the A100, and the B3 all have the same exact insides of the organ. So they sound exactly the same, except they're a different cabinet. The C3 models were, um, as far as I understand, they were have more of a church-type uh, outside look. I think mine even has, which is in my living room here, the one that's on that cover, has some little crosses around that. That's right. It's got the little crosses around it. Tell us about the transition from uh, Sugarman 3 to to this group and, you know, how do you sort of rectify all the different uh, groups you have? Right. Well, Scone Cash Players um, started, uh, I think the first record we made with that group was 2009. Um, and I just wanted that band to be focused on funky, groovy organ music, things like that, in the vein of Sugarman 3. And maybe taking some more chances. For example, the new record. I love some records that have vocal groups on them, kind of like the Donald Bird, a new perspective, right? Uh, Blue Note stuff, and also Freddie Roach. All that's good is a major influence on me. Um, so when I was thinking about what to do on the new record, I really wanted to incorporate that element. So the organ is functioning as the lead singer. And then, but with a vocal group backing it up, almost like a, a choir. And, um, you know, with, with Sugarman 3, it was more of a stripped down, uh, funky instrumental kind of thing. But on this new record, you know, we have a string section, we've got a choir, we've got a, you know, a bunch of different percussion. It's it's a, just a different sounding thing altogether. Right. And uh, absolutely, the 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 vocal. I was going to say to you, this is sort of the most vocal instrumental album you know I've uh, heard in a long time. Uh, listeners should you know, as you explained, but they should know that they're getting some great organ playing, but that most of the songs have a sort of a meditative lyric behind them, as you know, sort of underscoring the the tune of the theme of the song. Um, it's a unique arrangement, and it r reminded me. You mentioned, of course. Uh, uh, Donald Byrd, but it reminded me also of Sergio Mendez because of, I guess, the the bossa influence there and and the uh, few singers. You know, they had that that sort of um, that sort of arrangement. Uh, how did you kind of who was singing on that? How did you sort of figure out the arrangement there? How that was going to work? Yeah, I had it all mapped out in my head, and um, whenever I write music, I try to really think everything through. And so when I was making the demos for it. Um, I had all these layers and all these things. So when it was time to really get the vocal group, we were lucky enough to get uh, Sandra Williams to sort of lead the group who was in uh, Sharon Jones and the Dap Kings as one of the main uh, singers with Sharon. And also they have their own record, the Son and Star record, which is which is a phenomenal record, uh, one of my favorites. And then um, some other people, we did it in uh, Riverside, California. So... A lot of people that Gabe Roth works with there, great singers, and we all came together and, um, you know, made that beautiful choir happen. It was it's an amazing day for me to hear it all come together in a, right in front of me and, and unfold. You know, I'm a big fan of music too, which I, I find more and more. So when I get to be around people that have all this amazing talent and I can really see them work and it, it's, I just love it makes me happy it's just fun it's fun to be there even though you're the creator even though you're the uh the head of the session it's still fun to watch everybody do their thing yeah definitely and i guess you've you know after with your time that you've spent with daptone and the records that you've released there you've got a great cadre of uh talent to pull from i guess your 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 iphone is probably full of uh great names and people you could just kind of ring up and say hey i need a great guitarist over here you want to jump on this you you must have a great uh catalog of friends yeah definitely I'm, i've been working with uh daptone and before that desco 
since um, those first Sugarman Three records, which I think we recorded in 1996, maybe 1997. <laughs> so that's going on uh, 25 years of uh, collaboration. So, you know, there's such talented people and everyone involved in all the music that they make is, is uh, everyone has a very unique talent and is very cool and easy to work with. And yeah, it's a, it's a great environment. Yeah, it seems like a nice uh, family, nice family group there. Tell us about the album does seem to have some Brazilian influences there. Uh, uh, Brooklyn to Brooklyn is the name of it. And I guess there's a who knew there's a Brooklyn, Brazil. Yeah, I didn't know that either. Um, my wife is from Brazil and she grew up in the neighborhood Brooklyn. Oh, no so, kidding. So, yeah, I started um, traveling there to see her. And it's interesting how it reminded me, the neighborhood itself, Brooklyn, where she grew up, reminded me of the neighborhood that I lived in for uh, some years in Brooklyn. Hmm. Just the look of the building and the energy of the city. I mean, Sa Sao Paulo is uh, is New York, you know, times maybe five or something like that. It's a giant city. And to feel that energy, I kept drawing comparisons between the two. So that was the inspiration um, the, my travels back and forth um, between New York and Brazil and, and here in Florida. And, um, you know, I think all the music that I've been, all the new music I discovered in Brazil definitely has uh, rubbed off on me in a, in a good way, expanded my, my thinking a little bit. Oh, very cool. I love uh, Brazilian music too. And, you know, back to the writing, uh, you've written, you had a few co-writers on this album, but you're the primary songwriter on the album. And back to the vocal thing, how did you kind of, you know, as I said, I used the word, I, I kept, as I was listening to this album, I kept coming up with the word like meditative. Um, you know, there, there are interesting vocal um uh, 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 sections that are, you know, repetitive and you kind of get that, oh, okay, I heard this, I'm hearing it again. And you kind of get into this groove of kind of understanding, what did he say last time? Oh, it's coming around again. Let me check it. <laughs> you know, so it's kind of <laughs> cool. And it, it keys you into the, like, I, I would almost use that word theme. The songs have a theme, which is kind of like a, a duh, but the songs, you know, a lot of songs don't really have a theme anymore. And especially when you're approaching something like jazz organ or something, you might not necessarily be thinking about very thematically, but your the, the lyrical part of this really um, is interesting. Can you talk a little bit about how you compose those lyrics and, and how you sort of decided, well, this song kind of has this feel, so we're going to put this lyrics. How did you kind of uh, work with those two um, things, the lyrics and the music? Yeah, you know, I, on this record, probably more so than than other ones I've made, I kind of was I was leaving myself open to just go wherever the song wanted to go, I guess. Right. I wasn't trying to write anything in a particular style. Um, I was just sort of sitting down at the organ and just letting ideas come to me. And with the meditative part, I think that's somewhat intentional just because of the idea where the, the organ itself is the, the lead singer instead of there being a lead vocalist. So the background vocals would kind of be like, you know, if you're maybe listening to Gladys Knight and the Pips, something like that, Gladys is doing uh, the lead singing, but the, the vocals, as cool as they are, they might get repetitive because you're hitting that same section. Right. And then then and then she can go and and, you know, change the melody a little bit for to be different, uh, to express a different feeling. But the background vocals might hit the same thing every time. So uh, that makes sense that it can see, seem like that. And also on this record, there's some, you know, more somber stuff and some introspective things that you might not normally get on a funky organ record. So, you know, <laughs> I just let myself go with it. Right. Well, cool. Is there a tune on the album that is you're particularly fond of that you really like? Yeah, I really love. Well, this doesn't have vocals, but I love the Golden State, how that came out. Uh, I wrote that as a feature for Jimmy James, who's playing the the great guitar on there. And he just he just knocks it out of the park. And then Neil Sugarman, of course, from Sugarman Three, playing sax on the album. And then he ends the song with his 
amazing sax solo there. I I love that one. Are you a big vinyl guy? Uh, Daptone obviously has always had a, uh, a a great vinyl following and component to their releases. And this one sounds great. And uh, just curious, are you a record person or are you, you know, some people like it, some people don't really care. You know, the digital sounds so good nowadays anyway. Yeah, no, big, big vinyl person. I mean, I probably have the same experience as a lot of people uh, my around my age where I started out with vinyl. I spent a lot of years getting rid of vinyl and now I'm spending a lot of years getting vinyl back because uh, for me, it just, it just sounds better. I I love to put on a record because it feels like you're, it's closer to being in a room where the band is because it's actual sound vibrations moving, I think. Right. Um, but yeah, my collection's growing, not as big as yours. I see yours there, but it's uh, it's getting there. <laughs> I don't have enough scone cash back here. Th- those first few albums are tough to find. Yeah, I mean, uh, Coal Mine just released uh, re-released Blast Furnace this summer. Uh, that's I love the way that record came out, and they've certainly helped me out, uh, Coal Mine Records, to get that to more people. Um, because at first, you know, I would just do everything myself and make the record print up 300 copies and uh, call it a day basically. Right. But they've been helping me and daptone has been helping me uh, reach a, a bigger audience. Yeah. And you think, do you think those other, uh, well, how many albums were before this one? Do you, do you expect you'd like reissue them all or? Uh, we did mind blower, um, uh, blast furnace as the screw turns and now Brooklyn to Brooklyn. So this is our, fourth full length one no concrete plans to reissue anything right now of those other two but i'm certainly open to possibilities you know I, i'd love for people to hear it cool cool do you have any albums that you really that really um sim symbolize you know the pinnacle of hammond organ jazz stuff that you really love maybe one or two records that are just your 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 go-to favorites that inspire you with the instrument yeah, definitely. Um, Jack McDuff Honey Dripper is in the top one of uh, all my records that I love, especially for organ. And I, I, it turns out I have a lot of records in my top one. So, <laughs> but if that's the first one that I choose, then that must be uh, up there. Um, there's another record called, uh, it's a George Braith record called Laughing Soul. And uh, it's got Big John Patton on organ. And that's another one in my top one. Those those are the first, first two come to mind. That's a great one. The arrangements are awesome. Uh, Grant Green's on it. Ben Dixon, who I worked a lot with in Brooklyn and around New York, is the drummer. The jazz organ rabbit hole is a great one to go down. You know, I, I started with Jimmy Smith, of course, and uh, sure. uh, did get it, you know, but you that, that's that's where you start. You know, you start there, of course. And there's so much. I don't think I realized as I got into jazz and music and the organ and getting interested in it, I didn't realize how many other people really did that that sound and that thing. And um, uh, it is a it is really a rich, fertile ground out there. And you can you can find a lot of things that people don't really even know about. Yeah, and that's there's a a Jimmy Smith record that's also in my top one records that I should mention. It's called The Boss. It's on Verve. It's a trio record. I think most of it has uh, George Benson on it, and it's a live recording in some club. It sounds like there's maybe five people there that right. uh, don't really care that they're even playing. <laughs> but I mean, Jimmy Smith organ playing on that record is so amazing that's been a giant that one particular record has been a giant influence on on me did you ever get to meet him in your travels sure yeah well i saw him play a lot and then i um how old was i i think i was 25 i had a pretty for a 25 year old and even today i had a pretty terrifying week where i was uh playing in lou donaldson's band mm. at the blue note in new york city and the other band was Jimmy Smith's band. So we were trading sets for that whole week. And it was a lot of fun. But let me just say, it was a, I was pretty nervous, especially because every other great organ player came to that show that week. So right. you know, a, lot of, a lot of pressure. But They were waiting for you to goof up. Everybody wanted <laughs> The pressure was on. 
Like, who's this 25 year old kid playing with Lou, you know? Right, right. Um, well, cool. Uh, what's what's coming up next for you? You've got a lot of things on the uh, on the burner, but what's what's next? What do you what do you see? Let's see. I've got some tours booked, uh, but as a side man for the rest of the year, and then I'll start doing my own gigs again next year. We just finished up a little run of record release shows. We did one in Brazil, one in New York, some stuff in Ohio, some things here in, in Miami. But next I'm playing with a great band out of the UK called the Filthy Six, um, doing some gigs in the South and then uh, doing some shows in Austin, Texas in December. And uh, yeah, some just local stuff with my band here in, in Miami. And then next year I plan to get more into Scone Cash players and take the thing on the road. Cool. Well, listen, listeners should know that you must be a nice guy because only nice guys would be able to play the Hammond organ and have people help them carry it out of the club after their after their gig every evening. So you must yeah. be a nice guy. That is a uh, that is a constant struggle. But, you know, we've got the dollies and uh, we've we try to make it e as easy as we can on ourselves. But, you know, still. uh still something to reckon with that's for sure well keep soldering and keep retubing and uh keep that hammond magic alive and uh congratulations on this record and congratulations on all of your uh all of your groups and all the work you're doing and uh i wish you the best of luck with them all right well thanks so much it's been a real pleasure to talk to you and uh appreciate uh everything vinyl district does it's it's uh it's just a great platform for, to learn about new music and <laughs> vinyl music. And as John does a John, the editor there, does a great job, and it's a, it's a great resource if you love music and something new's coming along. It's a great place to learn about it. Definitely. All right, my friend, you be careful out there, and uh, thanks for talking. And we'll we'll keep in touch. All right, sounds good. Thanks again. Okay, see you later.